for inviting me here. Uh, Dean, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I'm wired everywhere. <laughs> and I want to thank my wife because if it isn't, wasn't for her, I would not be speaking any longer. just give you a, a brief, brief background on how this all started for me. Uh, I, I grew up, for the most part, in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, and my grandparents had a cabin up in Woodstock, Michigan, which is in northern Michigan. And uh, we were up there in August of 1964, and uh, I experienced missing time. We had gone out to play into the fields, uh, and I laid down in the tall grass, um, and I can remember throwing chestnuts out of the way to create a place for myself to lay. And when I, I fell asleep, and when I woke up, um, it was almost going on 9 o'clock. And I remember getting up and running back to the picnic area where the family was, and there was a police dog, a Michigan State police car there, and uh, my folks and cousins, because it was kind of a family thing because everybody goes back to school. And uh, I got the tar looked out of me uh, for disappearing, and I told them where I had been, and they didn't believe me, so I took them back to where I was uh, with the flashlights, and sure enough, there was my body imprint, and they swore they had been all through that area looking for me. It wasn't until age 14 that I actually understood what had happened then. Um, I went to bed. It was just a normal night. Uh, it was in October. Um, when I... I woke up and there were two men looking down at me and they were human beings except they have no hair and their skin is light blue or at least more in a the very large one his skin is light blue Viseus is the elderly one and I'll give you a brief background on them um, has turned white because of his age but they are blue skinned um, they say that they are our cousins and that we actually have some of their genetics inside of us uh, they originally came from Lyra as all human life did in our galaxy uh, human life does exist in other galaxies as well and um, there's a lot going on <laughs> I, there's a lot going on. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I was taken out of bed many times. I was given information. I was given physicals. I was given brain scans. I was shown. They put a little cap on my head and they showed me who I was in past lives and my direct connection to them and my connection to the earth. And... Uh, and then there were no more contacts after age 14. There was one at 16, but it was a physical. I was not awakened. It wasn't until 1985 that the con contacts started again um, on a regular basis. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, now, just to give you an idea of where I was in 1985, I had worked for a few years for the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> I was a, uh, had been a tax collector, and I was assigned to a, 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 and I'm ashamed to say it, but I was a good tax collector. <laughs> and for the lady and the people who are, who are talking about the IRS, um, I'm just going to just give you this while it's hot and it's fresh. Uh, I was assigned to a, uh, a task force that was supposed to do undercover work for uh, oil company fraud. And our training was to be in Washington, D.C., and while I was there, I used my security pass to get into the National Archives. And uh, you're not allowed to really make copies of things when you're in the National Archives unless your security clearances was much higher than what mine was. And I'm going to tell you this as having been with the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service is a Puerto Rican trust. It is a three-tier trust. Um, I don't know what the third tier is, which is the bottom line, but it's, it's Internal Revenue Service, Puerto Rican Trust, trust number 62, and I can't tell you what the third one is because it wasn't there. Or great. People need to know. Um, also, none of the federal uh, income tax laws are actually in the Federal Register, therefore they are not laws. They are codes. You also need to be aware of that. Um, 
anyway, I left the Internal Revenue Service and I opened up my own accounting practice. I started helping people um, with IRS collection problems because that's not something that you can learn going to tax school or uh, going to a university. You have to have on-the-job training. Well, I started my practice, I uh, took the CPA exam. For five years, I had a practice in Beverly Hills in Malibu. I was living on a 700-acre horse ranch in Malibu at the time the contacts restarted. Now, within two months of the contacts restarting, I totally walked away from my tax practice. And uh, I, just, I just realized that a lot of it was just BS. And uh, it just wasn't working for me. I had made some major shifts in a very short time. The contacts have been relatively continuous. Um, they're, they're both physical as well as telepathic. And um, folks, some of this information is going to be enlightening. Some of it's going to really bother you. And I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you that we have a very serious problem on our hands. Okay? And it is just not the federal government. It just is not. There is a much bigger scheme going on here. And um, it, involves, it involves extraterrestrials who are interested in us as souls. Uh, you might refer to the Bible. You might refer to whatever texts or religion you have. But there definitely is a battle of good and evil going on out there. And part of it has to do with us and our solar system because of its location and the minerals that are here. The regressives, and we're going to talk a little bit about that after I show you the moon pictures, don't give a damn about us. We are a natural resource. Okay? Be really clear when I say this. They are, we are a natural resource to them. They don't care who you are inside. They don't care. <laughs> As far as the federal government, we watched the movie Rob Roy the other night, and there was a line in that movie that sums it up perfectly. The government believes truth to be a lie undiscovered. But that's really where it's at. That's really where it's at. They are so screwed up that I don't believe they even really remember what the bottom line is now. Um, okay. Um, if some of you are familiar with Hoagland's information, I think Richard does a good job, but I'm just going to share with you a personal experience that I had with Richard in Los Angeles. Um, I was speaking in Los Angeles. I've spoken along the West Coast uh, quite a bit in Texas. And uh, there was somebody from Showtime who was doing a private screening in a hotel room of the movie Roswell, the Showtime movie Roswell they put together. Well, I was invited to go in there. Well, Richard was sitting in the back on a chair. And I, I'm not reading any more into this. I'm just sharing, you, sharing with you my experience with him one-on-one. -on -one. I sat down to him, and I just looked him straight in the eye, and he didn't have a clue who I was. And I said, Richard, why don't you tell people that the moon is an artificial satellite? And he just looked at me, and he says, I'm not ready to. All right? That's that's my personal experience. It's the only one I have. I think his information is good. But I'm telling you, from my own experience, he's withholding. And I don't understand why he's withholding. I can verify that. Okay? Because, because you, me, our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren are the ones at stake here. You know, we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have any place to hide. This planet is our home. It's our home. And, and I'm just trying to help. I only have a piece of the puzzle. I don't have the whole puzzle. I think if I did, I'd be dead a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to share with you stuff that I have been guided to that's on the far side of the moon. I don't deal with the physical side. Because as the right hand is moving here, the left hand's doing something else. Well, the left hand is the far side of the moon. If you remember the movie Apollo 13, um, if you remember the movie Apollo 13, what? Move over? Oh, it's the lights. Okay. If you remember the movie Apollo 13, all hell's broken loose. They don't know if they're getting home. 
but they were so concerned about checking out and taking pictures of the far side of the moon. Now here they are, they might get home, but their focus wasn't on getting home, it was seeing what was on the far side of the moon. That is a true enactment, folks. Now I'm going to show you some of the things that are there. Now these are, now so you may have trouble adjusting your eyes to seeing some of this. Some of the things you will not have any trouble whatsoever. These photographs, I was told specifically where to look, were taken by the Lunar Orbiter 4 from August of 1966 to August of 1967. They show so much. Apollo 13, what? Move over? Oh, it's the lights. Okay. Do you remember the movie Apollo 13? All hell's broken loose. They don't know if they're getting home. But they were so concerned about checking out and taking pictures of the far side of the moon. And here they are. They might get home. But their focus wasn't on getting home. It was seeing what was on the far side of the moon. That is a true enactment, folks. Now I'm going to show you some of the things that are there. Now these are now so you may have trouble adjusting your eyes to seeing some of this. Some of the things you will not have any trouble whatsoever. These photographs, I was told specifically where to look, were taken by the Lunar Orbiter 4 from August of 1966 to August of 1967. They show so much. <laughs> I mean, it's, if you know what you're looking for, it's unbelievable. I just, it's unbelievable. You know, and uh, there's no way our astronauts miss this stuff. There's just no way. You know, 21 mile bridges, seven mile monuments, uh, ships sitting in the middle of craters. I mean, you know, you're going to see it. Okay? Um, I'll tell you what the Andromedans, Morinae, and Theseus have said about the moon. And I, I want to take questions, so I want to get through this. They have said that our moon is an artificial satellite. In fact, it is a spacecraft. Much of the debris on the surface was put there and was built purposely to make it look like what it isn't. Okay, it is hollow, it is metal underneath it, and uh, it has the ability to leave our orbit under its own power. <laughs> they say it came from Ursa Minor from a, uh, uh, a solar system that would have the symbol or uh, would have the name in our language of Chauta. It was one of four moons that rotated around the 17th planet. Now it was built, this sounds just like Star Wars, it was built around that 17th planet. It was then put into the tail of a comet and then dragged here. And when it got to this area, it removed itself, and the first place it parked itself in our solar system was the planet that we now know of as Maldek, which is the asteroid belt. It was one of two moons that belonged there. Maldek was the first inhabited planet in our solar system. It was very much like Earth. Mars and our planet were terraformed from Maldek, or Malona, or whatever name you want to call it. It was terraformed. In other words, all the plant life and everything that is on the surface and animal life was brought here. It was brought here. You know, science science tells us that, you know, everything started with a single cell. The Andromedans laughed at that. You know? And 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 Phaseus said to me, Well, if that's true, then how does that one cell know to become a brain cell and a kidney cell? <clears throat> I couldn't answer him, because I don't know. He says it isn't possible. Our solar system has been engineered, built and engineered. Okay? The whole solar system. Um, we're going to get into some more of that, but I, I want to get going on the slides. Honey, you want to come up and help us with that? Um, let's see. Okay, according to the Andromedans, now folks, I just want you to keep an open mind. You know, I'm not asking you to believe this. I'm sharing information with you. If you choose not to believe it, hey, that's fine. I ask you to exercise your free will. And if this gets too much for you and you don't want to listen, I'm, I've already checked. None of these chairs have seatbelts. You can absolutely leave. I will not be offended. I don't like doing this anyway. I would much rather stay home and raise a family. Okay, but I, I made a promise, and, you know, we, we want to have a family, and, you know, I have pieces of the puzzle, and if I don't do anything about it, then I'm just as guilty as, as, as the NSA astronauts and the Russian astronauts that have been on the moon and been on Mars since 1958. Okay. 
The lights, please. <laughs> there we go. Okay, our galaxy. Can we raise it up? Uh, no, we need something, a videotape or something to put underneath it. <laughs> that's good, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we can lower that. No, 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 here. Wait a minute. Here. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Andromedans, space travel has existed in our galaxy for 4.4 billion years. Okay, we are literally the new kids on the block. All right? Now, what's interesting about our galaxy is... <laughs> All right. Um, space travel has existed for 4.4 billion years. The interesting thing about our galaxy is the fact that we have many different races living here. In particular, the human race, which we are a member of, and what we call the reptilian races, which we are not a part of, but who very much don't like us, like the human race. Apparently this battle that's been going on has been going on for approximately 3.8 billion years between reptilian races and human races. Many of the planet, many of the, of the races that exist in our galaxy migrated originally from Lyra during a war. Apparently, uh, sometime in our ancient past, a group of reptilians were exploring, looking for minerals, looking for food resources. They came across a star system that was full of human beings who were agricultural uh, in their nature. Uh, abundant food, just they just had everything together. And the reptilian races, they're called the sea car in the Andromedan tongue. We know them, or uh, we would know them from, as being known as the Draconans because they are from Alpha Draconis. And apparently they as a race were brought to our galaxy fully formed. Nobody knows where they came from or who dumped them there. But they were put there because it gave them the highest probability of survival. Well, they are a remarkable race. They're incredible builders, but they have an attitude problem. And that is that they believe that they are the dominant species and they control everything else. And they are also master geneticists. They, they value genetics, not gold or silver. They have no interest in that. It's life forms. And they try to control life forms through manipulating their genetics. We have also um, been subject to that. I'm going to try to cover a lot here. Anyway, there was a war. They were attacked. Many of the human races fled to, Alpha, uh, to Antares, to the Pleiades, to Cygnus Alpha, to Andromeda, to Cassiopeia, to Cirrus, to uh, Procreon, all over. They just scattered to the winds, trying to survive. Next slide, please. This is where our small little area is located. That which we see in the sky, this is where it's located. As you can see, we are in the sticks, the boonies. We really are. Um, and this is why we've been, been manipulated and messed with so much as a planet and as a race. Um, because we, are, we have been, for the most part, we were, for the most part, considered insignificant. And then roughly 5,000 years ago, um, somehow they found out that we were no longer insignificant, and I will tell you why. According to the Andromedans, in our physical form right now, in our genetics, we have within us the DNA of 22 different extraterrestrial races who have come down here and manipulated, who have bred with us, who have tinkered with us, uh, everything imaginable. And that somehow we have all this inside of us. Plus the fact that we're coupled with spirit. And this is something that the Greys have a major problem with. And I will cover that as well. Now because we are 
the only race in our galaxy that has these genetics of 22 different races, because we are also spirit, they consider us royalty. The Andromedans consider us as royalty. Now, one of the factors that they look at, and the thing that totally awes them the most, is the fact that many of the more advanced races use technology to to create things, to manifest things. The Andromedans are heavily use holographics. Whatever they need, they create holographically. It is physically there, but when they're done with it, they turn off the switch and it's gone. It doesn't just sit there. All right? Like if you go home and your couch, you go away for a year, that couch sits right there. They are amazed at how much energy we put into creating things. Things. Just things. Little tchotchkes that you put on the shelf. Books. You know, all those things take an intense amount of energy to create. They're amazed that we have this ability. The other thing that amazes them is they're also amazed at how easily we can allow our own kind to starve, to go homeless, and to kill each other. They do not understand that at all. Okay, and destroy our environment. Um, one experience, I actually I'll give you two experiences. One experience was with, with the Sayas. I had just come up on board and I was I was being led into a room and the Sayas had been watching a television transmission from Chicago. And policemen had just shot a black man that was running away. And then the policeman apparently ran over and tried to save his life. Okay? Viseas turns to me and he says, I don't understand your race. I don't understand why one would try to take his life and then the next minute try to save it. I didn't have an answer. In fact, many times I don't have an answer. Another time... I, I came on board, I was living in Lake Arrowhead at the time, and Morinay was looking at a group of meters on the ceiling of, the, of, this, of a ship. And it was all about the ozone and the air, oxygen content in our atmosphere. And he looked very distressed. And, he, and I said, what's the matter? And he said, don't they understand that all of this is here because they need it? They don't understand how we can just so carelessly destroy our environment. Now, folks, I want to share something with you. If there was not divine intervention, which apparently there has been, uh, March 23rd of 1994, if there has not been divine intervention, and I will cover that, according to the Andromedans, we would only have 41 years left worth of oxygen in our environment. 3,500 years ago, the oxygen content, they say, was at 35, fluctuated between 35 and 38 percent between the North and South Poles. Today, at its highest level, it's less than 18 percent. Now, those of you who took biology, what happens to the human form when oxygen, as a gas, goes below 15 percent? We die. We suffocate. This is reality, folks. This is reality. This is not Peter Jennings. Okay? This, this, you know, I mean, we, don't, we don't have anywhere else to go. You know, and for, and for those, those, and this is just what I've been told, and for those, those of you who think there's going to be a rapture, you might be disappointed. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not saying this to, to question your belief. I'm just telling you that there are much bigger forces going on here. Okay, next slide, please. Save, save the question, sir, for later. Okay, please. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our solar system. There is life in all of these systems surrounding us. They have been coming here for years. For years they've been coming here. Okay, Myth mythology, there's, you know, there's a shred of truth in all of it. The work that Zechariah Sitchin is doing, um, uh, an, a, an absolutely fantastic book is called The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. I would suggest that those of you who have not read it, go get it in paperback version. It'll bring you right up to speed right away. It's wonderful. And he's not a UFO person, which is why I enjoyed it even more. It, all the truths just led him right to it. In fact, there are more truth. There's more truth that the aliens are out there than they aren't. They just don't want you to know because they don't want you to know who you are. 
because the minute we wake up, the game's over. They cannot control us. And if you look at our past history, if you read Zechariah Sitchin's books, we as a race, when we stand together, rebel against the gods, the ETs. We rebel because they have been, pardon my friends, shitting on us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and holding us back. Next slide, please. Okay, here's Earth. If we could just get a little focus, thanks. Um, this is what's left of Maldek. You know the series of planets. Uh, the moon is not the only artificial. There are nine artificial moons in our solar system, and I will share with you later what those are. Um, I just want to cover a lot of information. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay, this is the typical and traditional picture. Does that look focused to you? Yeah. Okay, maybe it doesn't. Okay. This is the traditional picture that we see of Earth. Um, we got an awesome home, folks. <laughs> it's one of the nicest ones around. Um, but there are some things about our planet that have been withheld from us. For example, our Earth is, in fact, hollow. It is hollow. I'm the next slide. I'm going to show you a NASA photograph that proves that there's an opening at the North Pole. Okay? You can find this photograph in a book called Our Violent Universe by Nigel Calder. It was first released in England, and I don't know how this one slipped through the cracks, but it did. Thank goodness. Um, we are told that the gravity of our planet has to do with the rotation. According to the Andromedans and their science, the radiation of the sun is what causes gravity on planets. And any body, planetary body that is approximately 29.3 miles or larger is capable of sustaining gravity because of the radiations of the sun. Now I realize that flies right in the face of what we've been taught. Well, again, I'm just here sharing with you. If you were to go from the surface, from, from downstairs the parking lot, go approximately 821 miles, you would reach a huge open cavern that does not literally have a sun in it, but apparently they are electrons, and as they go through the surface of the planet, they break down to their finest point, which is light. And that, at the very center of the planet inside, is the strongest force of gravity, and that is why they collect, and that is what is literally the aurora borealis. It is these electrons, these particles, coming out of the top once they have totally broken down, which is why it's almost in a circle. Almost always in a circle. Next slide. Okay, right here. This is just north of Greenland. This is exactly where Admiral Byrd said he flew in. Right there. This was taken in 1979. Now, you mean to tell me the Gemini, the Mercury astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, when they came back, they missed this? I don't think so. I don't think so. If you can get your hands on the book, there's a color photograph. This is a photograph from the book. It is, folks, it's there. Whoops, there it is. It's there. Next slide, please. Okay, our moon. Our moon is quite the enigma. Apparently our moon was brought here 11,213 years ago, to be exact, in the month of March, that we know is the month of March. Um, it came here as a base, okay, as, as a ship carrying ETs. They were coming here to colonize. They did, in fact, colonize. In fact, many of what's left of them are living underground in our planet from 100 miles to 200 miles beneath the surface. Now, I've gotten a lot of crap for talking about this, but I'm, you know, I'm just not going to shut up. The beings that brought this, are brought this satellite here to our planet in the last 25 years are responsible for over 31,000 children disappearing from the surface. 
And I don't know if you're paying attention, but over 100,000 children a year are vanishing from the face of the earth. And folks, they're being taken out of here. And the, the governments know. The world governments know. All right? And we're going to cover that. We're going to cover that. Next slide, please. Okay, did our astronauts really go there? I know that there's been a lot of talk that maybe they didn't go there because of anomalies and pictures. A lot of talk that maybe they didn't go there because of anomalies and pictures. Many of the pictures were faked because the pictures that the astronauts took, there was stuff all over the place. They couldn't hide it. Yes, they did go. But yes, there's been a manipulation of other things put in there that supposedly looks like our astronauts. So, you know, we have to use common sense when we look at these things. The next slide, please. Did our astronauts see things? Absolutely. <laughs> Moirne has told me that the United States government, just our government, has at least 53 of its own UFOs, flying saucers, that are stationed on the moon, on the far side. And I'm going to show you where he says they are. It's in one of the slides. They did, but they were told to shut up, not say anything. Um, many astronomers who have been taking a look at the moon, many of the lunar rovers and the cars that they drove have disappeared. They're no longer there. You know, well, they just didn't get up and float away. Okay, the moon has got gravity, especially on the far side it's got gravity. Morinet has told me that if you take Copernicus Crater and you stood at the bottom, that the gravity is equal to that of Chicago as if you were standing in Chicago. Because again, it is not the rotation. It is apparently the sunlight, the sun's radiation that creates gravity. And this is just what they say. Now, our moon does not turn on its axis. It rotates around the Earth, but we primarily just see one side, or only 59% of it. <clears throat> By the way, our moon's the only one that does that. You know, it's the only one. Next slide, please. Okay, this was um, taken out of National Geographic. This was in the early 1950s. This was NASA's idea of what moon bases would look like. They, in fact, did do this and create this in February of 1958. So when Kennedy said, you know, we are going to send man to the moon, Part of our government, primarily the NSA, was already there. They were already there. Now, folks, you don't hear much about the Russian space program, but let me tell you something. They are a major player, and they are also here. And they don't work for us, neither does the NSA. They work for international bankers who are the new priesthoods for extraterrestrials. And we're going to cover that. Next slide, please. Okay. According to the Andromedans, there were primarily nine huge dome cities on the moon, the front and the back. They housed up to five million extraterrestrials at one time. There was water, there was vegetation, there was everything they needed. Okay, and these covered hundreds of miles. You know, so when Richard shows you the pictures of the things, you know, the shards, so many miles tall, 9, 10, 15 miles, whatever it is, he's right. He's absolutely right. You know, but there's more. There's more. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is along the equator on the far side of the moon. This is what's left of a pyramid. There are four pyramids on the moon. Excuse me. Okay. Now, I can assure you that the pharaohs, just to practice, did not take the Hebrew or the ivory up here, build one, then bring it back and do it right in Egypt. Didn't happen. According to the Andromedans, almost all the planets in our solar system have pyramids on it. Some have more. I've asked why. Some people say they're tombs. The Andromedan perspective is that these are weights. And what they do is you put them in a strategic location, it balances the rotation of the planet. It doesn't keep it from wobbling, which means that if the ETs are there colonizing, there's no major fluctuations in weather and gravity. Gravity anomalies as well as the electromagnetic field, which is around every single planet. It has to be balanced. That's what these are for. That's why Giza is directly dead center of the landmass on planet Earth. 
Next slide, please. Okay, can we just focus this a little tiny bit? Okay, folks, I want you to focus on this area right here. I want you to focus on this structure in here. For those of you who are architects, <clears throat> please feel free to, you know, say something about this. This area right here, you can see the curves, the angles. There's another bridge here. I want you to notice these lit up objects inside the bottom of the crater. We've got a close-up of it. Next slide, please. Here we go. Okay, here's another bridge. Apparently, this is inhabited by extraterrestrials from Orion. These are, I'm told, are domes. Does everybody see this? Okay. I'm also told that this is a road that goes into here. There's an elevator that goes up to this area here. And when they land, they take an elevator or something down, and then they, they can walk because there's atmosphere on the far side of the moon, which is why the astronauts took pictures of clouds. <coughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, the snow job that we've been given. It's nothing what we've been told it is. Nothing. Right. Next slide, please. Okay, I want you to focus on this. Let me just turn off one. Um, I want you to focus on this area right here. Now, I realize this might be difficult, but I do have a close-up. This is, this is a crater, and there is a structure that comes across it. You can see the sun coming through this way. You can see it shining right here underneath. And you can see this is still in the shade. This structure here. This is a 21 mile long bridge. Next slide, please. Here. I'm always updating. I'm always trying to get clearer pictures. This is 21 miles. Now you might have to, you may not see it. You may have to adjust your eyes. Um, I know this isn't easy, but this is it right here. Okay, you can see the sun shining through here. <coughs> now we didn't build this. And how is it that our astronauts missed this? 21 miles. That's from here to almost a boulder. Next slide. Okay. Look at this. Just sitting there parked. This was taken by the Lunar Orbiter in 1966. Next slide. Now, isn't it interesting that we're told that the craters were created by meteorite impact, impact, or incessant meteorite bombardment. I just love that. Okay? And yet, you have full-fledged mountains in the dead center of these craters. Many of them are even higher than the crater walls. Folks, that's just not possible. It is not possible. You have craters that are 30 to 40 miles in diameter. The deepest one is only 7,000 feet. That is also an absolute impossibility. Richard talks about his dome structures, okay, that had some kind of a glass on it. Right here. I believe, and I'm told that this is what's left of one of Richard's domes that he has a picture of, the, you know, with the long shards and the pieces hanging off. This is what's left of it. As you can see, there's a shiny spot of the glass tickered in, but that's what this is right here. <coughs> this apparently also was a dome city, but it was destroyed by particle beam weapons between what we now know as the Orion Group and a group from the Pleiades. This happened approximately 9,600 years ago. Full out war here. Next slide, please. Okay, I want you to just check out this area here. All these structures, look at these. <coughs> Apparently these are hangars. This is a complex that is inhabited by human beings from Earth. 
also want you to look at this object. I, I'm trying to get a better picture of what this large structure is. And what's really interesting about this area here and this is look at nice how sharp this crater is. The corners here. Very nice and sharp. Here. Very nice and sharp. Next slide. This is, I just wanted to show you this structure here. This is absolutely not supposed to be there. And apparently it is the ruins of a, of a ship that was destroyed 9,600 years ago. Next slide. Piece of shard. It's two miles. Two miles tall. Piece of what? Shard. Piece of metal. Next slide, please. Okay, on this photograph, I want you to just take in the landscape, okay? I want you to take in the landscape of what you see here. Now, I want you to look, focus in on this area right here. I want you to look at this area here, and I want you to compare it to the rest of the landscape. Just focus your eyes for a minute, okay? I want you to focus on this area, and then the rest of the landscape. What's unusual about this area right here? Anything else? Maybe the way these things are all lined up together, nice and neat, and, and then these structures right back here. Next slide. Okay, here's another picture of it. Is that a monument there, the dark arrow? This here? No, that's an arrow. That's, that's my arrow. <laughs> okay. This area here, I have been told by the Sayas and Moronay both, is a, a base that was built by the United States, the Russians, and the British with the help of bankers using technology that was given to this elite, this ruling family, by the Greys in 1954. They've been up here a long time and this is actually considered a resort. This is not Club Med. <coughs> Next slide. More ruins down here. Here and in here. These are not supposed to be here. These are pieces of spacecraft, apparently, that were destroyed um, 9,600 years ago in, in, in a, a war that took place in our solar system. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the same structures I showed you earlier. Here's some more ruins. Now, I want you to look at this area right here. This, apparently, is what's left of a dome, one of the dome structures. And these pieces that you have on the inside are pieces of the roof that just fell to the floor of the dome. You can look, you can see it, you can see there's a circumference, here's part of the wall that's fallen down this way, okay, and here is part of the dome that is still intact. If we go to the next slide, I might see a little better, but we'll have to focus it right here. Well, maybe not. Okay, this was also destroyed in that war 9,600 years ago. Next slide, please. And if you can see this, uh, this is very light. This is a piece of a bridge that crossed this crater where half of it's gone and half of it is just still standing there. I don't know exactly how many miles across this is. But again, how did our astronauts miss this? Next slide, please. Okay, these are more ruins. I've, I myself have even had trouble seeing some of the things in this, um, but they've been very strong about this particular area, so I felt it was important to include it and just share it with you because maybe somebody in here will see something more than what I see. You know, people often do, so I'm just trying to share it. Um, these structures here, it's just, it's a weird place. Again, this is along the equator on the far side of the moon. Next. A lot of those craters have a rising piece of metal. 
Yes, sir, they do. Yes, sir, they do. And, um, you know, some of them are full-fledged mountains, and they're just not supposed to be there. Next slide, please. Okay, now, look at this. Honey, is that the best we can post it? Okay, thanks. This area here apparently are, is a domed complex inside this crater, and I'm told that the world government picked this area because there's water underneath it. These are domes. These are a series of domes that are lit up from the inside. Is that square thing the pyramid? Which thing? This? This here? I don't know exactly what that is. It's not discernible in, in the in the pictures. You know, I think sometimes they purposely blur these just a little bit. Next slide, please. Here's another area in another crater. This is all lit up from the inside. Next slide. <clears throat> this structure here. This piece, this thing here, this length of, of object, whatever it is, is 13 miles. And it's just sticking up outside, out, out of the crater. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this area right here. Everybody see this area? Is that a yes? Okay. How many of you have been to the Sears Tower in Chicago? You ever been to the top? It's about a mile high, right? I guess that's what they say. It's about a mile high. Next slide. Here it is again. Now, I want you to know these photographs were taken from me. This particular photograph was taken by the Lunar Orbiter at 86,000 feet. <laughs> okay. According to Moran A, this is seven miles high. And it's a monument to one of the old ETs. Next slide. Here's a close-up of it. What's that? What is it? Your suspicions are pretty accurate. Back up just one more time. Okay. Now let's look. Now look. Now just you know, look at the rest of the terrain here. Okay. Look at the rest of the terrain and just look at how this sticks out. Seven miles. How come our astronauts missed it? I mean, I hate to be redundant, but I'm just hoping somebody will have the answer. <clears throat> Next slide. Oh, we did that. Okay. One more time. Okay. This particular area, I'm told, is now being reactivated. Um, they say, more and to say, have said that all of this are ruins and that there are underground facilities all through this area. And I just wanted to share it with you because they're very strong about this particular area. And this is a dome that is apparently that was still left intact. <laughs> Next slide. <coughs> Square craters. Now I've asked, I've asked uh, Warren A. specifically, and he said there's no such thing as a square meteor. <laughs> so, <laughs> just one of them weird things. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, craft sitting here, hanging over a crater. Next slide. These are all taken by the lunar orbiter. Weird crossed objects sitting in the middle of craters, dead center. Next slide. This was the photographer. Let's go one more slide. Okay, back up. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody else, I think uh, George Leonard wrote this. Somebody else is on the moon. George Leonard. Yeah, George Leonard. Somebody else is absolutely living on the moon. I am told that there are 35,000 full-time human beings from Earth 
living on the moon. And they are Aryans by birth. Now let me just say that one more time. They are Aryans. Now let me just say that one more time. They are Aryans by birth. <coughs> they are Aryans by birth. You're going to have to research one because if I come right out and say it, I'll get in deep trouble. Okay, Aryans by birth. <laughs> They're also there with extraterrestrials. Between the moon and our earth, there are 18,000 graves here. There are only apparently 2,000 real graves left. All the rest are clones. They're robots. They're organic robots. And microprocessors are grown in their head. And they are controlled by some kind of a radio frequency. Now, the Greys and the Orions also have this have this technology to absolutely replicate and duplicate a human being. And for those of you who are familiar with the old Dr. Beter stuff, before he was killed in a parking lot in Dallas, I would suggest you go back and re-research that information. Except he was told the Russians were doing it, and they're not doing it. It's a extraterrestrials who are doing it, who are trying to undermine the free will of those of us on the surface of the planet. Because this is our home. Okay, Mars. I'm still working on uh, more information, but I'm going to show you uh, a couple things and share things that I've been told about Mars. Um, the first thing I want to share with you about Mars is that, um, again, everything we've been told about it is wrong. Um, Mars' atmosphere is full of oxygen and ozone. In fact, uh, the local San Diego paper on uh, March 23rd of 1995 uh, flat out said that in 1971 they had discovered it was full of ozone. Well, folks, you go to the library and you pull out any book that you can find on Mars written by any scientist on this planet, and they don't say virtually anything about ozone. But it's there. We're told that it has, that its actual gravity is about 1%. Well, if the, if the atmosphere is so feeble, then how is it that it can have 300 mile an hour wind storms? If the atmosphere is so feeble, how is it that it can hold up the water at both poles? Next, next slide. Let's go next slide. I'm sorry. At both poles. And there's water at both poles. This is water, H2O. We're told that the Martian atmosphere never gets above 129 degrees below zero. And yet, this past February or March, you had a picture from the Hubble telescope of Mars and the North Polar Cap melting. Now, I'm not a scientist, but tell me, how does water melt at 129 degrees below zero? I'm open. <laughs> I'm open. <laughs> okay, apparently Mars has been inhabited off and on as a base, as a small colony, as a staging point for extraterrestrials who are exploring and leaving our galaxy to go to another for 3.8 billion years. The ruins that Richard shows and other people, they're tombs. This is what I'm told, that they're tombs. And that there's far more there than is being shown. Most of it's been buried. Because during a war, a war previous 69 million years ago, Mars was almost exactly like Earth. In fact, Morinet has said that many of the animal life that was on Mars is, is on Earth. <coughs> That when we get there, when we as a race get there, publicly get there, we will find that there were dinosaurs, many of the exact same animals and mammals and reptiles were on both our worlds. And that Mars had a totally different orbit. It was literally pulled from its orbit, um, and as it was pulled from its orbit by 19 million miles, it rolled like a ball three times. And the water that was here just moved everything. And that it's been reactivated. It was reactivated in 1989. 
Now, I did a lecture in Dallas, and I've been talking about this information for, for several years now. And I was told that in 19, 1989, Orion troops landed on Mars and took over colonies that were, that were settled, created there by Terrans, us, by human beings from Earth. They came in and just took it over. Now, this gentleman who approached me, and I'm just sharing this with you, said that his best friend's brother worked for Central Intelligence and was a director of NASA and resigned in 1991. He said that his brother told him that the meetings on Malta, on the ship just off the coast of Malta between Gorbachev and Bush, were about what was going on in Mars and that they were scared to death. Now, folks... I got I got to share this with you. The beings that are here from Orion, um, they're they're into control. They're into control. There is no such thing as self-rule in the Orion Empire. There is a hierarchy. Now, if you look at our planet, I mean, if you really look at what's going on on our planet right now. There's only one nation that truly cherishes self-rule and actually has real experience in self-rule. That's the U.S. And we're armed to the hilt because our Constitution says we, we can be. This is why the focus is on destroying the United States of America. Okay, the UN, the World Order, all of that stuff, they're all taking orders from ETs and they're scared to death. But they are willing to sacrifice this nation. They are willing to kill three and a half to four billion people to maintain their place as the new priesthoods. This is Sumeria. This is Egypt all over again. But on a much grander scale. Because now you've got six billion people living here. <coughs> if you, if the people of this nation surrender the Bill of Rights by 1998, folks, you will no longer have the United States of America. That's a guarantee. That's a guarantee. This is the reason the Andromedans are coming back. Because 317 years into our future, our galaxy is in tyranny. And they have traced, through time travel, all the events that lead to the single point that shifted the energy from free to tyranny. Now we're not just talking about free, we're talking about also on a spiritual level. Suppression, oppression of soul, of spirit. And they have traced it all back to our solar system, which is why many races are coming back and then saying, hey, wait, this isn't going to work. Because 317 years in our future, there's tyranny here. There is no such thing as freedom. And we somehow are dead square in the middle of this thing. <laughs> Sorry for the news. But we are. This is the only reason they're bothering. <coughs> Next slide. Save your questions, please. Write them down, okay? You all know about the face, or most of you, uh, I'm sure, do. There is a lot more in this area that needs to be explored. Those of you who are researchers, please get pictures of not the face, but go north, where the mountains are. Okay? There are ruins everywhere. There are domes collapsed on top of themselves. In fact, there's one that's still there that looks, looks like Texas Stadium in Dallas with the opening in the middle. It's there. It's there. Next slide. Um, I just put this in because everybody's interested in the, the physics. I'm not a, a physics person. Um, <laughs> um, but it is important because it all matches up. You know, there are symbols in all of this. In fact, I want to share with you about crop circles. I've asked a lot of questions about crop circles, and I'm told that there are two groups leaving crop circles. There's the Andromedan Council, which is made up of 139 different races, which is putting encoded information into the Earth to help sta stabilize it from Earth calamities. They're trying to buy us time. And many of the other crop circles that are being left are being left by Orion. Now, where are they coming from? They're coming from Hale Bob. Hale Bob. 
Hail bomb is not a comet. Which are chips are going to move out of the tail and move into an orbit around Mercury. And this is in February, March of 97, and they're going to be they're going to tell us they're here for sure. That'll be the latest. The highest probabilities are is that by the end of November of this year, after Spielberg's movie about Roswell is released, they're going to start telling you that they're coming. But they picked up signals. And the truth is they picked up signals back in 1960. You know, um, and in fact, they were already on the moon in 1960 with extraterrestrial help. So, I mean, the whole thing is a conspiracy within a conspiracy within a conspiracy, and it is all to keep, keep us fat, dumb, and stupid. Not to spook the herd, as a friend of mine said. Because they fear us. They fear us. Because if we stand together and we ask for benevolent help, folks, it's going to be there. In fact, I've been told that the Andromeda Council has already decided to directly intervene, but I don't know what that is. I can tell you this, that the Pleiadians are at full-fledged war with the Greys outside our solar system. They're, they're dying on both sides. This is going on, and the Hubble telescope sees it, and there are two Hubble telescopes, not one. The Russians sent one up, but you're not being told about that. Next slide, please. <coughs> Olympus Mons, 15 miles high. 1979, NASA admitted that they saw water vapor and ice clouds going over it. That's 90,000 feet. <laughs> okay, that's higher than the clouds on our planet. <coughs> now we're told that the circumference of Mars is 4,200 feet. The Andromedans say, eh, wrong. They say it's 11,230 miles. It's three times the size we're being told it is. The Andromedans also say that if you look at the planets in your solar system and you look at the brightness of those planets, that is proof that we live in a binary star system. They say we have two suns. But because of the rotation and the position of our planet, we never see the sister. But if you're on Venus, Mercury, or the others, you would see it. They rotate around each other. I, I realize it flies in the face of everything. I'm just here sharing with you, and I'm just asking you to keep an open mind. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay. Um, Cydonia is in the northern hemisphere. Now, I'm told that at one time, most of that area was covered with water. And that along the equator of Mars is where most of the colonial cities were, colonies, outposts. They said much of the bigger cities on Mars before it was destroyed was in the southern hemisphere. Now I want you to, can, honey, can we focus on just a shape? I want you to focus on this area right in here. Now this, is, this area is known as our great plantation. This is in the southern hemisphere. Now, there's a little happy face. Yeah. I, I thought that was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but if we go to the next slide. This apparently is another tomb that was in fact destroyed. And these are three more pyramid, pyramids that are lined up just like Giza. This area right here. And that these are also ruins. This is what they say. And folks, they've never lied to me. Right here. They want us desperately to wake up. Now they have their own selfish reasons. Okay, because of the fact of the problems that apparently come up in the future. But there's also another reason. Many of the human races in our galaxy, because of so much interbreeding between the one race, the genetics apparently are starting to break down. There's only one race in our galaxy that can give these particular human races a genetic boost. And that's us. But they can't use our genetics. They can't even approach us because of the vibration we all move at, which is fear and anger. They say when we're not taking advantage of others, we're taking advantage of ourselves. <laughs> That's correct. 
we're, it's, it's, well, it hasn't stopped the regressives because they vibrate at this frequency and they've also helped to propagate the belief, many of the belief systems that we have right now. Um, we have real problems because this is all coming to a head by the year 2000. Um, they're going to be here in 97. And, uh, I mean, you know, official protocol ships from Orion are going to be here. Now, I want to share with you some of the things that the Greys are up to. Many people say they've left. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but apparently they're still here, and they have no intentions of leaving because they need us. They are desperately trying to save their race by using our genetics, but it isn't working. They can create the form, but they can't put soul in the body. That's a gift. Now, here's what they're doing. This is what I'm told they're doing. I'm told that many of the abductions that are occurring now, that the vital body, the aura of the people being abducted, which is primarily the females in a family, and it's usually the first and second daughter and the mother, what they are doing is they are peeling off the vital body, the closest part to the energy field, and they are storing it and they are feeding it to the hybrids that have that mother's genetics in it. And apparently they're doing this to keep them alive. And they're also apparently trying to create soul. They think by stealing your aura, the vital body, in your energy field and giving it to another, that it will create soul. You need to be aware of this. Okay, this is why a lot of folks who are weird things are happening, they're getting real sick and run down, it's because your vital life force is being stripped from you. And folks, there is a violation of free will big time going on here. You know, there are a lot of lines in metaphysics. And one of them says that you are, you create your own reality. Well, that's true. But there is a violation of free will. And we are being violated big time. And our race has been for the last 5,400 years. Big time. I'm dealing with the race we know ourselves now as Homo sapiens sapien. I don't know, is there another slide? Ah, Phobos. Phobos is an artificial moon. This is where the majority of the 2,000 real graves that are left are hiding out, is on Phobos. And when you look at pictures of Phobos, when you go through your magazines or you go through, um, you know, the astronomy magazines, I'm told that you should, I've, I've been asked to share with you the idea that you should look very carefully about the inside of craters. That many of the openings that lead into this are inside, inside the craters. That the bottoms open up and the ships come in and the ships come out. Okay? Now, Phobos is a major anomaly because it goes counterclockwise to everything else in our solar system. It rotates counterclockwise to everything else. Uh, let's see, there's one more. Okay, this is the North Pole of Jupiter. This is a photograph taken by the Voyager. I'm oh, sorry, the Galileo. Anybody care to tell me what that might be? <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> yes, that's the North Pole. When it went over, it photographed this sitting there. <laughs> it could be. It could be. I'm, I'm just sharing it with you because I want you to think about it. <laughs> I think it's a satellite. It's a satellite, but they caught on top. That's a very good answer. I know it is. One day they'll get it. One day they'll get it. Next slide, please. This is Ganymede. Ganymede's another artificial satellite. Um, Ganymede has life on it, has water, has an atmosphere, has oxygen. Um, many of the benevolent races use this as a base. This is Ganymede. Has an atmosphere, has oxygen. Um, 
Many of the benevolent races use this as a base. What does Ganymede mean? I'm sorry? That's Jupiter. It's one of the moons of Jupiter. Now, if you look carefully at the satellite we just sent up there, and you look at the rotation of what it's focusing on, um, the, the moons that it's focusing on will tell you an awful lot about what it is that they're looking for. They do nothing um, without a reason. And uh, let's see, is this it? Okay. okay, next next slide, please. I think that's the last one. That's the last one. Okay, we can have the lights be great. Thank you, Dean. Okay, I can I can come out from behind here. <coughs> Okay, I want to share this with you, um, this last thing. I was told that March 23, 1994, that 19 suns pole shifted in our galaxy, and that many are pole shifting all the time. At exactly the same moment that the suns in our galaxy pole shifted, a color and sound frequency started emanating from all the black holes in the known universe. Now. Apparently what this sound and color frequency is doing is it is literally creating a holographic density above all, all, all others. And on a numerical level, it would be, at our level, it would be considered the 12th. The Andromedans say that there are 11 creational densities in our universe. This is now adding a 12th. And that what it's doing is that it is literally lifting all the dimensions up. 11 is going to 12, 10 to 11, etc. Now they say that all indications are that by December 3rd, in our linear time of the year 2013, third density as we know it will cease to exist. It is now presently imploding on itself as it is being raised to a higher vibration. And that those of us who go, stick around and go for the ride will be moving through fourth into fifth density. Just like that. And that we will start to see very clear indications of this um, around the year 2007. Now, apparently the Andromedan Council, which is a group of 139 planetary systems, and I can't tell you exactly how many races because I don't know, has made a decision and has told all of the extraterrestrial influences in our solar system, both benevolent and non-benevolent, and those who are in the middle, to be out of this solar system no later than August 12, 2003. I don't know how they're going to back it up, but apparently they've decided they're going to. So they want them all out of here. Now, <laughs> if, if this happens and they do leave, you're going to see incredible things. If they do not, I have been told to tell you this. But there's a very high probability that we will wake up one morning or go outside one night and the moon will not be there. It will be towed towards Jupiter. And they will deal with the energies that are there out there. Because if they have to go to battle and the moon gets destroyed, it will destroy most of the Earth because, you know, pieces of it will come here. Plus, it has an energy source inside of itself. Okay, it's a spacecraft. Um... So this is another possibility, and, you know, um, I talked about the tides. I mentioned the tides, and more, and I said, hey, that's no big deal. We can just get you another one. <laughs> Apparently, it's no big deal. You know, planetary science is no big deal when you're at that level of technology. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know that the moon has moved closer to Earth. What do they say about that? About two years ago? Um, apparently, it's, it's moving closer all the time. Um, the Andromedans say that it's moving nine inches closer to us, and we're not being told um, about anything about it. They're also, they also have said that Mars is also moving closer to us as well. That it's moving closer? I don't know what it is. Unless it's to disrupt the, uh, uh, the gravity pull will create earthquakes. 
what's nine inches have to do with 240,000 miles? I don't know, sir. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Where you get to where people can the back cannot hear these questions. I'm sorry. I'll repeat the questions when they're said. Thank you, Dean. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The question is if if the if the set if the satellites or the moons are artificially artificially created, why do they make the surfaces so rough? Obviously to hide what they are. Um, other than that I don't know. Yes. Man in the back. Yes, um, Okay. The question is if there's really a battle between good and evil, are the benevolents more powerful? Do they have more? And do we really have a chance? Oh gosh. Um I believe, I've been told that if they stuck together, yes, they could resolve the situation here. But there are, there are some significant problems that they have. Now, back in 1985, when I was being told all of this, there were a lot of discussions going on back in Andromeda about what to do with us. Now, half of the Andromeda Council didn't want anything to do with us. And their reasons were this. These were their sole reasons for not wanting to help us. They don't respect them, their home, they don't respect each other, and they don't respect themselves. What is their value? Now the side, those that wanted to help, because they have seen us as totally being violated with our free will, somehow convinced them that this was a worthwhile project. Now, intervention not only changes our reality, it changes their reality. And one of the things that the Andromedans and Moranay has said specifically is they don't want to come down here and help us when we don't want to help ourselves. Because then they end up babysitting. And if something happens, then they, we could always blame them. And the cycle starts all over again. This is about self-responsibility. That's what this whole thing is about. There are one group of ETs who say, well, there's no way. You cannot be self-responsible. You cannot rule yourselves. And then we were given this opportunity 200 and some odd years ago to try this experiment. And we succeeded in doing it. But now we're being lulled back into a place where we want somebody to take care of us. Yeah. And, and you know that, that, that you're going to sacrifice your freedom. I'm not about to do that. Neither. So who's going to win? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. I wish I had a place to hide until it was over, but I don't. I, I, you're right. Uh, the question was, uh, she added, that we've been manipulated and they've helped to change us into a different direction. You're absolutely right. However, when I brought that question up to Warren A, he looked at me and he said, are you aware that your government is drugging its young people? And I said, well, yes. He says, are you aware of a couple other things that he mentioned which are really sensitive? And I said, well, yes. He says, well, what has your race done about it? I mean, 19, what, 1986, 1987, West 57th Street, twice in six months, showed Air Force personnel unloading bales of, of marijuana and cocaine off of planes at Hempstead Air Force Base, unloading it up with weapons, and it taking it off, taking off for Costa Rica. Twice they showed this on national TV. What happened? West 57th Street was taken off the air, and nobody did anything. Again, it comes back to self-responsibility. They are watching us. They are watching us and saying, should we come in and help this race when they don't want to clean up their own act? When they don't want to take care of their own? Do you realize, and, and big time, and those who don't want to make a shift are going to be checking out because 
the frequency, everything is changing, folks. And I'm not trying to instill fear in you. I'm trying to share with you what they've told me. And they have not been wrong. Things are going to radically change. And it's going to start just like this. It has. It has. You watch November of this year, it's going to get really weird in this country. Really weird. They're going to try to divide us. And because if you divide, you can conquer. And whatever you do, please don't turn on each other. The enemy is underground. They're on the moon. It is not your neighbor. It is not your policeman. He's not the enemy. You know, if you want to do something really constructive and you don't know what to do, just do this one thing. Come November, if there's an election, vote. Whoever's been in office, vote them out. Start over. That will buy us more time. Nothing. Apparently there's been this divine intervention and third density is moving into fifth. Therefore, they say this is going to happen by December of 2013, so the 41 years won't go by. So, we've been rescued on some level already. But I don't know how many of us are going to make it. You know, now, the, <laughs> you know, the world government has been told that we're overpopulated. Okay, by the aliens. The truth is, they can't control all of us. They can't control us here. So they decide they want to just eliminate half the world's population. Now, folks, I want to share this with you. According to the Andromedans, our planet could comfortably handle a population of 11 billion if we didn't squander our natural resources and we went to free energy. Right. Yeah. Now, the free energy has been suppressed forever. Right. If we went to that, we could turn this whole thing around. Right. All right? What's happened is the political systems have broken down, but they don't want to take responsibility for it because in order to fix it, they have to make us more free. And they're not about to do that. They are not about to relinquish control of you, your money, your assets, because you're a natural resource. So it's easier to create a catastrophe, like a pulse shift or something else, biological weapons, and just wipe out half the population. And they're still in charge. And I can assure you that those people that you call your world leaders, those who are part of this game, will be sitting on the moon watching all this happen. And when it's done, they'll come back with answers, just like a politician, you know. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back with the striped shirt. Uh, you mentioned something about economics, materialism, what have you. How does any of that correlate with your comments about your getting our souls in a place that uh, we think of in terms of metaphysics or religion? How does that fit in? Where, okay. Where does the answers come from? <laughs> Who could not have a soul? The greys? The, 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 the clones? That, no, I'm talking about, I, I'm referring to the clones, the hybrids that they're creating. They do not have soul. That's what I'm told. That's right. They're not actual beings. Microprocessors, organic microprocessors are grown inside their brains. Some of them are not, no. The ones who are not clones? Yes, they do. What was that question back there? I still didn't get it. We got off. Yeah, where does the soul of the spirit get into this? Okay. This possible solution. Why are we? Why are they so interested in us? Now, this is really going to stretch your belief systems. <clears throat> I am told that a majority of the physical beings, human beings, that are in third density, not only on our planet, but in 21 other systems, who are experiencing the same problem we are having, are beings that apparently at some time in our past were at 11th density. Now, the Andromedans have said that our universe, what we know is our universe, is a twin, in linear time, and this is the only way that I can explain it is in, as we count time, is that our universe is a 21 trillion year holograph. It's a holograph. It's a picture within a picture within a picture, or a dream within a dream within a dream, however you want to look at it. 
and that apparently many of the souls on third density were at were at eleventh density. And for some reason, this collective group consciousness decided they wanted a different perspective. And they literally fell into the concept of time, into physicality, and literally carved out of nothing what we know as third density. Now, third density to many of these other races is like putting your hand in jello and trying to move it back and forth. There's so much resistance, it's so dense. And yet here we are literally creating all this. That's how powerful we are. That's how powerful our minds are. Which is why there's been so much focus on brainwashing. On trying to make us victims. Or believe that we're victims. Because the minute we wake up and we take a step back, detached, and see our situation for what it really is, they've lost control. It ends there. The minute we awake. And this is why channeled information, so many different races and beings are trying to light the fire underneath us. Because they can't directly come in and interfere unless a percentage of us ask for permission. Because then it's a violation of free will. And they've done exactly what the regressives have done. Even though it was for our own good. You cannot violate free will. That's the law. So they are trying to help us awaken and at the same time try to make us think it's our idea. That's the trick. And, and, and it's working, I think, to a degree. But, you know, how quickly it's working, I just don't know. I'm scared. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I am scared about what the next four years are going to bring. What about the earthquakes? A lot of it is... A lot of it is I'm sorry, the question is, what about the earthquakes? A lot of, some of them are natural and some of them are being caused. Well, I wish I had a board. But what's basically happening is you've got a planet that is vibrating at a frequency of fear and anger. You've got this new frequency called the 12th density, which is lifting everything up. Well, these really dense energies cannot move up. So the planet herself, in order for her to move up, into fifth density has got to cut loose with this energy. And what's happening is that she's cutting loose with this negativity which she's been holding on to. It's hitting the surface and it's feeding us as a population because we're already in that space. You know, and, and you know, there are predictions of wars. Oh, God, we're all prime. We're all ready for it. You know, the whole world's broke. Everybody's looking for food. The world has got a food supply of 53 days. The entire world. The United States of America, should there be a catastrophe, has only a seven days food supply. What happens after those seven days? Are we going to start feeding off each other? That's our MO. Yes, sir. It's, okay, can you define densities, frequencies? Uh, density and dimension, they're really one and the same thing. They are a frequency in which light and sound osculate at. We osculate at a specific range. Other things osculate at other ranges, higher ranges. Uh, there really isn't anything lower than us at this present time. Uh, you know, there's only, we've hit bottom, there's only one place to go, and that's up. <laughs> As the old saying is. So it's a frequency, it's light, it's sound. If this is a holograph, if what they're saying is right, that this is a 21 trillion year old holograph, then all of this is just light and sound. Now, there are places in space where there is nothing, no matter. According to the Andromedans, those are areas that have not been magnetized by thought. Now, with the first aspect of physicality, the first sign of creation, they say is the electron. The moment that particle is magnetized by thought, it comes alive and it starts to create and manifest whatever is energizing it or magnetizing it. I know it's out there. I still have trouble with understanding a lot of it. Yes, ma'am. This is a time frequency that you see them for the 2013. Does that have anything to do with what... I still have trouble with understanding a lot of it. Yes, ma'am. This is a time frequency that you see them for the 2013. Does that have anything to do with what some people are talking about, some of the control and others about the 
Um, the question, the question was, does the time time of 2013 have anything to do with what astrologers or astronomers are saying about the photon belt? Ma'am, they have never mentioned anything about the photon belt. In fact, the Andromedans have absolutely no belief system whatsoever in astrology. And I, I don't mean to offend anybody, this is their perspective. They say it's all a belief system. How does it all agree with <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> he, the gentleman said, "How does all of why why does this all agree?" He said, "Why does this all agree with the King James version?" How does this all agree with the King James version? Well, I will just tell you. This is a very touchy subject. Um, I will just tell you this that Morinet has told me that it is not it is more important to know why you believe something than why than the fact that you believe it and in their opinion the fact that we all believe or a majority of the people believe in the book of revelations that we are literally going to self fulfill it <coughs> Let's see who else I see somebody pointing to somebody else who doesn't want to raise his hand, probably. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, Richard Hoagland talks about... Could you stand up? I can't hear you. Okay. I'm sorry. Richard Hoagland talks about hyperdimensional physics, mm -hmm. and through that, we can change our reality. So this is really what you're saying, is that if we believe in the book of Revelation, we pray. So wouldn't it be an idea that if we change our thought about the year 2015 as something uh, other than a uh, outline there, and that's sort of what he is saying, is hyperdimensional physics can allow that person to change the reality through their thoughts, and it's basically in physics. And that would be eliminating fear, because if we go into anything with fear, we cannot change our thoughts. I don't know, I just, when you said you were afraid, it made me uh, concerned about <coughs> your information, although I really think your information it sounds to me very valid, but when fear can change that reality, <laughs> yes, you know, it, it, you're, it does. The fears that I have are my own. Um, how do I put this? I have a lot of years invested as a, as a child and as a young adult in Christianity. I have been made aware of the fact that there's no net underneath me. No net at all. And the fear that I have is my own belief in myself to be totally self-responsible. I can admit that. So that's, that's the fear. Because if there's no net underneath me, it lies squarely on my shoulders to figure out my reality. And when I see all this stuff going on, what is it that I want to create? You know, what do I want to create? You know, my wife and I want to have a, have a baby. I'm 39 years old. I've been in many other relationships and I've raised other children that weren't my own. Now I want to raise my own. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on that influence that decision. So, I, I, you know, I share the information, but I'm also sharing myself. So, you, you know, you have, you have to take that whatever way you want. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. There, the question was about reincarnation. If the earth is destroyed in the future, where will all these souls go to continue to reincarnate? That's a great question. Um, 
<laughs> I will share with you a couple things about that. Their theory, the Andromedan theory on this, on that is this. They say that all physical matter that came, that is in this 21 trillion year old holograph came out of what we know as black holes. So the Big Bang Theory is correct in its simplicity. But apparently what happened was some other universes somewhere also went through the process of evolving and those things that chose not to evolve to raise their frequency for whatever reason were taken into black holes and because spirit cannot be destroyed it has to create another space to continue to evolve. Now the Andromedans call that space consciousness. They call our universe consciousness because that's what created it. They say this is happening all over again. And the London Sunday Times this past Sunday, for those of you on January uh, 1st, the London Sunday Times on the back, apparently the Hubble telescope has found a floating black hole that is moving through, it's right now in Virgo, it is floating and it is pulling some suns, some stars into it, but not others. And they're just, they're gone. And they're actually watching this thing now. And that's the London Sunday Times, January 1st. For those of you who want to go to your newsstands and try to get it. It's on the back page of the front section. Big article. Okay, so, you know, there's a God. And whatever she has decided to do, it's going to happen. <laughs> Actually, I asked about that. And they said that, you know, that they call it the isness. They themselves don't know exactly what it is, but just that it holds everything together. But that if they had to give it a gender, it would be female. Because it creates. It creates life. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, one of the cross circles, uh, or a couple of them actually, this last summer, uh, showed the, um, the planets around the sun, almost like your one uh, picture was there with the asteroid belt, but it was, was interesting no. that, the, that the, where the Earth is supposed to be, there was no planet. There was the ring there that showed the orbit, but there's no planet. How did you, how did you, how did that, did you see that in crop circles? That I did not, but somebody told me about it in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I've not had an opportunity to ask about that. But ask it, would you? I'd like to know the answer. I promise. <laughs> I, believe me, I have a list of questions. Um, I'll get to you in one sec. Um, they, um, they say that the crop circles are fifth dimensional geometry. That's what it is. And um, in case you don't know that, crop circles have been showing up in the United States, but it's being suppressed. And they're primarily showing up along fault lines um, on, on the West Coast. Um, so stay tuned for that. They're actually happening, but the feds are doing an excellent job because of the satellites making sure that the minute they're created that you know they're out there as soon as possible to make sure it's bulldozed, plowed over, etc. Um, yes, sir in the back. Yeah, I was just uh, curious um, how did your communication process with the Andromedans and is it um, at your request or their request and how often does it occur and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's absolutely no pattern to it. And, oh, gosh, you hear Okay, he wanted to know how the communication with the Andromedans goes. Is it at my request or their request? Um, sir, there is no pattern to it. They let me know. I will go outside at night, which I do every night, and I will look up at the sky, and I will project a symbol, which is a communication that I have with them. And I don't always get a response. Sometimes I have to wait months to get a response. But it's, um, they're almost always at night. Um, they're both telepathic as well as verbal. Now, Morinae is the only one that has actually gone to the effort to learn to speak. The Sayus doesn't. It's all telepathic, and they talk in symbols. Now, when you start, for those of you who channel, you're already, you may already be aware of this, um, or mediums. I don't really like the word channel. Um, you get impression telepathy is is speaking in holograms. If that whole stack of papers and you put it all together, okay, when you're when somebody's talking to you telepathically, they're giving you that entire concept of everything like this. The whole thing is right there. It is not where I am describing, well, sir, we take this, we move it to the front of the house, then we take this beam and move it there. It's not like that. You get the whole thing instantly. 
And then you have to learn how to unravel it. It's taken me years to do this. And they've been really patient. And I'm not the only one. They're talking to three other people. I'm the fourth. There's one in Argentina who I don't know yet, but I've met somebody who does know him. Uh, there's one in Asia and one in Europe. And there are other groups that are also also contacting a lot of people here. Um, because we're different. We are really different. I'm not saying we're better, but we're different. And um, they apparently see some value in us, those that really want to help. Even the regressives see value in us, which is why they're so hell-bent on trying to control us and to suppress us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of energies coming. There are a lot of earth changes that are coming. I can tell you this beyond a shadow of a doubt, absolute proof positive inside of myself because I've been shown it. In eight years, Southern California will be eight islands. That's it. It's all going to be water, except for those mountaintops. So if you have family there, you got to let them know. New York City, New York City by the year 2000 will not be there. It will be ash. It will be sacrificed. It's going to be sacrificed. It's, the powers that be have already made that decision. Sacrificed. It'll be a sacrifice. An offering. An offering. Both souls that live there, their energy is going to be an offering. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, they can. Yes, sir. Natural phenomenon. That's correct. He said, he asked the question, basically he made a statement, the East Coast is going to be a man-made phenomena and the West Coast is going to be a natural phenomena, and I agreed with him. How does that agree with Kingsley's revelation? I don't know, sir. I don't know. He said it would be destroyed. I don't know that he said it would be bombed. It was going to, yeah, an act of terrorism would, would turn it to ash. By when? By the year 2000. When do you expect the California to start? Sir, I don't know. I could start any time. Truly, it could start any time. I'm amazed more hasn't happened. There are some really, really evil thinking souls here on this planet. I mean, it's unconscionable. It's just, it's unconscionable. If, if those of you know anything about the UN Biodiversity Treaty, if you look at some of the wording that's in it, it doesn't sound like a human being wrote that at all. You know, it, it, it's, it's just too weird. There's just so much weird stuff. You know, and, and that's because they were influenced. Set up by that I don't know. I think that maybe in its original conception it was um, honest, but it's certainly been perverted. Certainly been perverted. I want to get somebody else to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there can you comment on the Okay, uh, the question was, can I comment on angels and can I comment on walk-ins? As far as angels, um, <laughs> the Andromedans consider anybody who has spirit to be an angel. You know, you make your choices. You either you walk on one side or you walk on the other or you find the middle path. <coughs> Most of us are on one side or the other, and we're desperately looking for the middle path. Um, it's just spirit. They're, they're just folks on the other side, beings on the other side, who are trying to help and influence us to make decisions for ourselves. Um, if any of these angels supposedly tell you that they have all the information and that they need to follow, you need to follow them, like... Um, i.e. Ramtha, you need, you need to be very, you got to use more common sense and really trust your gut instinct. Because this is all about our evolution. You know, 
if, if it's true that we've been on 11th density, then we have knowledge, we have experiences that none of these other races have. And we already know how to do this. And we already know. And we just, we just have to somehow find out those keys. Every single one of you in this room has a piece of this puzzle. Every single one of you. You know, and, and you gotta you gotta honor that peace that you have. And you've gotta honor yourselves. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not awesome, because you are. You are so awesome. It's it's just beyond words. You know, they want to consider you a natural resource. You will only be that if you believe it. It's that simple. This you know, this does not have to be a major struggle. You know, unless we just stick our heads in the sand and, and go into denial. I mean, how could you be in denial with all this stuff that's going on? I mean, I, it, it blows my mind. <laughs> the regressives consider us a natural resource. They feed off of us. We make things for them. We produce for them. We create energy for them. They harvest our thoughts. You know, we can create things out of thin air, literally out of thin air, that they need technology to do. Everything, everything in your life was was made, was created, manufactured. Okay, even the idea was created. Okay, everything we've ever needed, this planet provided for us. How do you think it got that way? How do you think this planet knew exactly what to, to manifest and we would end up here and, and be able to use exactly what we needed? I don't know if I'm wording that right. I think we were here at the Okay. Now, this is, these things are supposed to happen in the next nine years, by 2004. Number one, scientific proof of dimensions and higher self-consciousness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, your consciousness, your thoughts, who you are, is not in your brain. The only reason that our bodies have the brain is so that our higher, our soul, our greater selves, whatever it is, can make the body move. Okay? Your essence is in your energy field. It's in your aura. That's who you are. That's your life force. That's where your consciousness is. It's not inside this bone right here. It's here. It's all around you. Two, reincarnation will be scientifically proven and demonstrated. Three, acknowledgement of other life in the galaxy and universe. Ample proof already exists on moon, Mars, and on the Earth. Four, extraterrestrial contact from at least nine different races. That's going to blow some minds. Introduction of free, clean energy devices based on magnetic fields of energy. Of course, they'll be introduced. You notice the word there. They've already been built. But the earth is hollow and capable of sustaining life. And the existence of a city known as Cal Nigor, which is in the hollow earth, that was originally built by Lyrans. The Lyrans were uh, one of the original races of human beings. Number seven, rediscovery of the lost lands of Atlantis in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, a very large temple complex still intact that belonged to Lemuria, approximately 150 miles southwest of Easter Island. Well, that's going to blow some minds. Number eight, reality that all we see in the physical is a holographic imprint directed and created from a higher portion of ourselves. Apparently the next 18... Well, that's going to blow some minds. Number eight, reality that all we see in the physical is a holographic imprint directed and created from a higher portion of ourselves. Apparently the next 18, 19 years, we as a race are going to evolve over 150 years. It's going to be like that. 
which is the way it should be. Mm-hmm. I mean, for every, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but for every two years that passes, military technology advances 44 years. Do you have any idea that the toys they have that you paid for? I mean, it's awesome stuff. And of course, they don't want to let us play in a sandbox. I mean, that's ridiculous. Would you go back to the one that you said before you said we were about uh, over 150 years in the next 10 years? In the next 18 years, we are supposed to evolve over 150 years. And then there was a statement before that, all that we think in the... In the physical is a holographic imprint directed and created from a higher portion of ourselves. Number nine, human consciousness is not in the brain, but located in its entirety in the energy field and aura. This is the one and a half to five ounces that the body loses at the moment of death. That's who you are. That's the only part of you that's really you. You just you just create this to, to play the game here. <clears throat> okay. Number 10. How our past and present educational processes have not prepared us to be completely conscious, creative thinkers. Number 11 that organic and plant life forms do exist on seven planets and 15 moons in our solar system. Yes, ma'am. Number 11, that organic and plant life forms do exist on seven planets and 15 moons in our solar system. Now, just because we don't have the technology to pick it up doesn't mean it isn't there. Okay? Number 12. Rediscovery that each of us is a part of the whole of the universe and the, we are a significant part of that idea that we call God. And that God is the idea called love. Number 13, that this accelerating self-discovery being experienced was created and activated by all of us. So, well, sir, that's the $64,000 question. You get that answer, will you call me and let me know? (laughs) I guess it's just, I guess, you know, I guess it, you know, I... I, when I look at history, and I look at where we are today, there's a history of repeating, of history repeating itself. And, you know, it's like a hamster that climbs on the wheel. No matter how fast he goes, as long as he stays on that wheel, he's not going anywhere. So maybe we just needed to make a change. You know, maybe we're all sick and tired of this. You know, maybe we need like a vacation. <laughs> My understanding, sir, is that they are different. Uh, your consciousness is completely different. And this is important. There is a physicality on all dimensions. Okay? Because you can... you there just There's a physicality. It's different from us. For example, fifth density, we live in a color spectrum of 72, 72 colors or light frequencies. Fifth density is 214. That's, that's a major shift. That's a major shift. Number 14, that we as a product of extraterrestrial genetic manipulations are possessors of a vast gene pool that has many different racial memory banks of at least 22 extraterrestrial races in our DNA. Many different racial memory banks. That means that when things get a little bit higher, our kids, you, you're going to start knowing things that you don't have any idea how you know. But you do know it. You will know languages that haven't been spoken on this planet for thousands and thousands of years. You will just know because it's inside of us. We're a library. You know, uh, Barbara Marciniak, her piece, they talk about this as well. And I think some of the other uh, groups do. Because of our genetic heritage, we are considered royalty. We need to acknowledge it, acknowledge ourselves, 
and sees our genetic heritage. Now I'm going to end on this. I was having a actually I'm going to end on two things. I was having a particularly bad month. Personal relationships and just everything else. Um, and it was time for me to come back here. I was living in Lake Arrowhead at the time, which is in Southern California. And I didn't want to come back. I flat just did not want to come back. So I got really upset. I started to cry. And I just I didn't want to come back. And um, as I saw myself, as I found myself on the ground again, I remember I heard Viseas' voice in the back of my head. He said, turn around. I turned around, and he was, he was at the door of the craft as it was starting to take off. And he looked at me and he said, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. And I just want to pass that on to you. Because nothing else that they have said has changed me more significantly than that. Yes, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. You disturbed me a while ago. You didn't have an end, and you just defined your intent. Uh, what, what gave you the idea that you did not have an end? It's a belief in oneself, sir. <laughs> I think that's what it is. It's a belief in oneself. A belief in the God in you. Yeah. But we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'm trying to get my all of myself away here. Hold on. I, I want to. I want to end up with this. I. I I'm done with this. I once asked um, I once asked the Sayas wrong microphone. I once asked the Sayas uh, I once asked the Sayas okay, what well, what was our future gonna be? You know, the future of us here on earth. And this was his response. This is the Andromedan definition of our future, us as a race. Responsible freedom of self-determination. Becoming truly self-confident and free to unconditionally be responsible for oneself without being coerced to accept some higher authority. I want to read it one more time. Responsible freedom of self-determination. Okay. Folks, thank you for coming. Becoming truly self-confident and free to unconditionally be responsible for oneself without being coerced to accept some higher authority. Ladies and gentlemen, you're awesome. Don't let anybody tell you different. Go out there and kick ass. Thank you. <laughs> about this. When Alex and Karma came, I told them they could have a table with tapes, books, as most speakers do. They do not do that. They live on a, a sort of a faith uh, uh, way of living, but they do have people in California who handle their tapes. And these free brochures are up here uh, and other things of, of his are in this Andromedan, or the letter from Andromedan, which is free, and it's up here on the front table. So you can pick that up and you leave. Also, if you want to copy of the directory of our membership,